This is Double Seven Radio. Strap yourself in because we'll be going on a ride deep to the heart of Earth's mystery. So right now I'm with uh, Alan Green, author editor of the Sync Books. His websites are allthehappycreatures.com and thesyncbook.com. So what I would like to ask you is, would you describe the sync book to me and a little bit more about synchro mysticism? Sure. Well, synchro mysticism is just sort of an um, it's a term that was uh, coined by Jake Kotza, um back in oh somewhere around like 2003, 2004, and he's a guy who was heavy into 9/11 conspiracies. And he, as he was going down these different rabbit holes, he starts noticing all these connections. And then he f comes up with this idea that he noticed all these esoteric uh, elements and synchronicities within the events of 9-11. And he starts to notice this bigger pattern, bigger pattern, bigger pattern. So he called 9-11 the 9-11 mega ritual. And as that got bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's like, well, okay, whoever's planning this, there's some grand occult masters. No, okay, it's... It's aliens or interdimensional beings or it's bigger, it's bigger, it's bigger. And then you go, wait a second, it's so big and it's so, and then on the same things, I'm experiencing the same synchronicities on a personal level. But wait a second, this is not some occult mastermind behind the scenes, you know, Mr. Burns twiddling his fingers. Yeah. This is the universe. What we're, what we're examining is this is the way in which the universe works. So you're saying at that specific time in the day, everything came together and allowed for the chance for that to occur and it could only happen on that specific day? No. Or no. that specific wave style signature? Sure. I, I guess, you know, I, I, the answer I'm constantly, it's a nuanced position. I, I hope I can make it clear. Mm. The answer is both. A and D. Yeah. A and D, always. The answer is that, of course, there's a human element. I'm not a solipsist. I don't think okay, we envision something and therefore thousands of people die, but it's okay because it's for our enlightenment and yay. No, it doesn't work like that. Horrible thing happened and there is a human element. Whoever, you know, if you want to go the official mainstream story that uh, 19 hijackers crashed those planes, well, those are 19 human beings who planned something. If you want to go the conspiracy route that it was George Bush or the Illuminati or et cetera, et cetera, um, probably more likely that it was some sort of intelligence agency or a government plot. I, I, I believe that it was not 19 terrorist hijackers. Um, but I hope whoever, that you have the right to believe that in your country. Oh, fuck. I don't know. <laughs> you can swear all you want, my friend. <laughs> yeah. You know, basically, you know, I, I grew up in the United States. We used to always say, growing up, people would say, like, oh, can I, whatever. And people go, sure, it's a free country. No one says that anymore. <sighs> um, Harsh. You know, but that, that was that was a very common expression growing up. People would say like, "Oh, do you mind if I smoke?" Sure, it's a free country. Oh, do you mind if I mind if I whatever? Sure, it's a free country. No one says that. Uh, but to say, "I hope I have the right," I hope, I hope everyone listening realizes they have the right. Don't let anyone ever tell you you don't have the right. Uh, that's that's the important thing. Don't let anyone ever make you feel like you don't have the right to believe something or to explore an idea. What we were talking about before we started recording was this idea of putting a question mark on things. It's okay to ask questions. It's actually ideal to ask questions. Even when you think you got it all figured out, sometimes it's important to remember you don't and to ask some questions. So uh, that's basically where I'm going with this. It's like there was a point where uh, I think a lot of us got into this idea of synchro mysticism was through examining 9-11 conspiracies because we are, most of us are, we're about, you know, in our early 20s, um, there's probably a few teenagers, early 20s, 30s, uh, but young people who hadn't been incredibly politically active or worldly in a lot of ways, and then suddenly, boom, this is a major turning point. We're being told our whole life has changed. A lot of us, you know, being told, you're supposed to go join the military and go to war, whatever it is. You know, I, I grew up in New York. I'm still in New York. My prom was at the World Trade Center. You know, so that was in 1998. So three years after my prom, boom, it's gone. You know, these are things where, like, it's I have a tangible connection to this experience. I almost feel it's like Gandalf came into your house and you were, you were, you were for He's like, yeah, you're going, you're going. And he's like, I, I don't know if I want to. Yeah, you, know, you got right. thrusted the question right in your face. And if you right. met the question with some 
honest curiosity, it led you somewhere. So let's find out where it led you. Well, it, I think for a lot of us, it went in a similar direction. Now, uh, I should make clear the ultimate answers, the the conclusions that we come to might be different. But I think a lot of us went on a similar journey, which is where you start questioning everything. And so you question your government. Um, there's a gentleman, Kevin Halcott, explained it pretty well. It's like when you're a child, you think your parents have all the answers and they control everything. Mm -hmm. And then you get a little bit older and you realize, no, actually, my parents, you know, they're just human beings. And then at some point you think it's the government. Oh, okay, well, the government's actually the real power in this sort of thing. And then you reach another certain age and you go, no, it's not the government. It's, uh, okay, it's some global cabal of bankers and, you know, secret societies or whatever it is. Okay, there's, but someone got it figured out. And as you get older, you keep realizing, no, actually, no one's got it figured out. So uh, that's sort of, sort of where we come at this, is to say there's something so much weirder going on here than most people give it credit for, than most people are willing to even acknowledge. Um, even within the, you know, uh, I don't mean to take this in a conspiracy direction, but to say, like, I do a lot of, I guess, do a lot of interviews for conspiracy radio shows uh, because there's some crossover here. And, you know, these people think we've asked all the hard questions. We want to know the truth. You know, it's the, called the truth movement. But you've learned very quickly they're not really looking for truth. They're looking for um, someone to blame. They want to point fingers at somebody to who's responsible. And what we're doing is also pointing fingers to say, hey, there's a phenomenon here. Please pay attention to it and at least factor it into your decisions. And now, it doesn't have to be if you're trying to find out who blew up the World Trade Center. It could be factor that into maybe how you approach your next art project or uh, how you treat your girlfriend or your next Thanksgiving dinner with your family or whatever it is. This phenomenon is there every moment, every day as you're walking down the street, as you're sitting on the toilet bowl, you're constantly interacting with something that is the reflection of the inner and outer worlds. And if we don't at least factor this into these decisions, we're we're letting we're letting ourselves be stay in an unconscious state. You know, I'm not promising anyone enlightenment. I don't claim to be a guru or anything like that. What I'm talking about though is trying to take things that we don't recognize often enough and try and make some of these things conscious. Because I feel like if we're at least conscious of them, we have a little more control, a little more um, ability to navigate these things instead of letting them run roughshod over us and being surprised. And very often, when we're surprised, we get reactionary and we look for someone to blame. Mm -hmm. hey, this is this what they happened. tried to get us on. They tried to get us on the fact that we were surprised. But if you were aware of things, you start to become less and less surprised and more and more educated. And this is, I think, where you're going with this. And what I wanted to ask you was, there have been special people in the past. They have left us evidence. So how far does synchromysticism go back for you? How far have you traced it back? I think synchromysticism is a very ancient thing. It's just a new, just a new word for mm -hmm. a very, very old thing. Um, you know, an early shaman walking through the jungles or the deserts or the tundra or whatever trying to recognize signs and omens in his environment you know oh there's a bird flying overhead what does that tell me oh I met um, a deer in the woods or there's a scorpion you know there's the practical side of oh scorpion equals poison mm -hmm. and then there's the you know when you start you, you've been using the term omens one that I like very much these are signs and symbols in our environment. And if we realize that we're not really separate from our environment... Um, no, the environment's you know, communicating with you. Absolutely. To the best uh, of your awareness. I, I, I definitely think so. I, I, again, and I'm not even sure that, you wanna, that we want to even, on this zoomed-out scale, are we even separate from our environment. The environment is us. We That's are the you. environment. Yeah. So, um, and then on a practical level, yes, you are an individual. I don't, I don't like to go to this idea of that, you know, we're not trying to disown individuality. There's something that makes you special. Mm -hmm. There's something that makes me special. We are individuals, and we should celebrate that, of course. So there is this communication between individuals, just as what's happening right now. And um, it's why I say it's both. It's, it's always both. We are one. Right now, you and I, we're the yeah. same guy. Mm -hmm. And we're also individuals having a conversation with each other. This seems to be the only way that really this 
in a strange sort of paradox, it's the only way things can exist. If everything was just one, there's no interaction. You know, you're interacting with yourself. But now so you're, how going, do you you're going off on, on topics that are more, they're more esoteric. So what I want to go back to is you had not mentioned a person walking in the woods. You had mentioned a shaman walking in the woods. So does that entail that a power plant may be used to start to, to tap into this, look under the veil and start to see these synchronicities? Because definitely for me as a personal experience, it was an ally that helped, that had helped me and still does to this day. Not Absolutely. that he's always needed, but he definitely he, comes through. <laughs> That's that's a that's a good point. I don't uh, I don't think we always need it, and I think there are some people who get uh, can get dependent on things, even non addictive substances. Um, you know, we've all known artists who can't. Uh, I've actually met a few guys like uh, I used to work in comic books, and there was a few guys like they had to stop smoking even marijuana because they felt it was something not that it was negatively impacting their art, but that they felt like they couldn't draw without it. It became a crutch. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so things like habit, yeah, I've drawn. yeah. So I mean, I don't think marijuana is in any way addictive. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, and I think that's a plant ally very, very much. It's something that helps you communicate, helps you get into tune with nature and your environment, and really delve deep into your subconscious. I think it's an excellent medicine, uh, as all these things are. But uh, I don't know if you know who Neil Kramer is. He's a British uh, speaker, really, really uh, amazing guy, and he made the point that. These things are great if you, we refer to them as plant medicine, meaning you don't take medicine every day. Yeah, they're very sick. Yeah, you know, right. So, so the it's time like, is right. yeah. So it, this is something that you treat with with some respect. I also don't think it's ultimately necessary. There are some people who I don't think can fully process the psychedelic experience, um, and it's not maybe not for everybody. So this is it's not to be elitist. It's just to say that there are probably other methods for other people. Well, so if what's... you look back in, in time, not everyone becomes a shaman. Everyone, Correct. everyone in our specific region, the northwest of, uh, sorry, the northeast coast, um, the shamans would give everyone a detura. They would give them a, a brew of detura, and everyone, upon uh, becoming an adult, would have to take this. It was only the one who was prone to detura that would seek it again and again and again for more allies and more knowledge. So it's it calls out to a specific archetype within specific people. Sure. And um, so, again, I, I think we're very much in agreement there. I guess what I'm trying to say is I think we've entered an age where there are other allies that are maybe more appropriate. Like, here's something. Mushrooms, for me, uh, I'm not, you know, not anti-mushroom, but mushrooms with me, there has seems to be some sort of... Um, they, unpleasant mixing and all the times that I've experienced uh, mushrooms and it's very possible that I just have some sort of fungal allergy or something where it doesn't react well with my body whereas other substances react very well so it's example? something where it's like uh, LSD uh, okay. for example LSD is, um, is still synthesized from a fungus sure so we're talking yeah. about oh, we're talking about psilocybin right as in the one that's not mixing Correct. So okay. I guess I guess what I'm trying to say here is that uh, you know more often than not, it's not like I want to tell someone to go with the synthetic route. I'm just saying on a personal level, it's the same thing as anything. Some people like chocolate. Some people like vanilla. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I have a relative who can't. You know, was allergic to whatever. I was told my whole life I was allergic to coconut. Turns out I'm actually not. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but this idea of like everyone's body is different, and I guess that's what I was trying to say. So. For some people, psychedelics, plant allies are very, very important. I think we also live in an age where perhaps um, there's technological allies. It's not really, um, there are of course dangers with technology as well. Um, mm. You know, there's, we can have internet addiction just as we can have drug addiction. But I think maybe for some people, this is more appropriate to their body type. Again, it's, it's just, I just feel like everyone should know themselves and what's right for them. And you all um, have your own journey. It's not like we, we all have the same one or else I could tell, sit here and tell you exactly what to do. The point is, is that it's your own journey and you are actually going to have your own separate allies from other people. Yeah. You know, if it was only so easy as, hey, if, if only we could get all 7 billion people on this planet to eat a mushroom, then we'd all be Buddhas yeah. and it would be a beautiful planet. If only it was so, that I easy. I think the Egyptians said that for the mushroom, <laughs> it's for those who know. So you could take it, and mushroom is a very forgiving spirit. You could party with him, and 16-year-olds are taking it in their basement, and he's totally fine with that. 
But for the ones who know, they get the true cosmic experience, which is basically, I liken it to the mycelium that lives underground is almost like a brain and a neural system. And you actually mm -hmm. tap into this neural system where it's, an, it's a brain that has been around since the dawn of time, the Alpha and Omega. And he will give you information. And apparently, he's from other stars. From what I experience and what for other people experience, he may come from other stars. It was Terence McKenna who said he couldn't figure out if the mushroom was the alien or it was the device through which the aliens communicate. And I think it's an excellent question. Yeah, because what if it's on their planet and they're taking it too? Through entanglement, we would actually be connected to that, that wavelength of a mushroom. Yeah, I mean, ayahuasca, the, uh, some scientists who had gone into the Amazon, Western scientists who had gone into the Amazon, when they were first uh, studying ayahuasca, they wanted to coin it for Western medicine terms. They wanted to call it telepathine. Oh my that God. was right. It was like, oh, we found this chemical compound that we're going to name after telepathy because that's what it seems to induce. Now we take this same idea: is if it's a sort of telepathic inducing uh, medicine, then of course it's a communication system. So should we get confused between? What is the actually the telephone? Mm -hmm. Is it a telephone or is it the alien? Is it just you know what ET uses to phone home? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not trying. I think well, did you know ET came to Earth to pick mushrooms? The first scene you is there with his family picking mushrooms. Yeah. Fuck oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's very clear. It's yeah. very clear. They got glowing magic mushrooms all around the spaceship, and his spaceship is even, of course, structured to look like mm -hmm. that. Um, Look at, yeah, here's something. If anyone wants to look at um, the, this is because we can get to some media stuff. Look at the movie poster to Muppets in Space. Oh, my God. Okay. So in Muppets from Space or Muppets in Space, um, Gonzo discovers that he's actually an alien. Okay. And the tagline for the movie is the ultimate Muppet trip. And if you look at the movie poster, you see that he's, Gonzo's being beamed aboard this saucer with these little dots on it and this beam of light coming down the center. Well, if you realize that beam of light is the stalk of the mushroom mm -hmm. and the disc with the little dots on it is your amnita cap. You He's, think it's, it's an amnita cap? I, I think, I think yeah. so, yeah. Okay. So It's uh, funny that, that the mushroom, when it inspires people, they almost unintentionally or intentionally leave those symbols behind. So yeah. I, basically, I believe that the, if it's about the Muppets, it's about a cartoon or like the Strumps or something. Smurfs for you guys. We go on Strumps here in Quebec, and I mean they live in they live in Amanita Muscarias. They they're blue, and Gargamel wants to eat them and put them in his stew. I mean, yeah. <laughs> to a yeah. T, it's about mushrooms. Yeah, I mean if um, my my friend Jason Barrera, who uh, who's a co-editor on the Sync Book series, he refers to them as you know they're definitely he considers them elemental spirits. Uh, Gargamel is of course an alchemist, mm -hmm. um, and they they play up a lot of that you know with his red shoes and all this sort of stuff. They they definitely this was done someone knowledgeable playing with this We're imagery. Back. Does it come from the Netherlands or from France? I think France. So there's a guy in France who's going to take up the, the skill and the art to make a cartoon back in the day. He's clearly uh, an, a specialist of some kind. He clearly had mastered himself in such a way where he was willing to take on such a task. Right. But uh, not to be a contrarian, but to say that the, the reason I study synchronicity so much is because what we've also learned again and again and again and again is that very often the artist is not aware. So like yeah. when you said, it could be unintentional. This is an important thing to remember. I think this is how people get stuck in certain, like uh, you see this all the time on YouTube, people saying, look at this music video and they've done this and therefore they know they're some part of some occult and conspiracy. they're sending messages to each other. Yeah, yeah. Right. Now that could be the case in some things. It could just be that, hey, this is someone with their belief system. I don't go to a Christian church and go, oh my God, they have a picture of a dead man on a cross on the wall. That's just an image that they associate with. Mm -hmm. So if you were someone who was, um, you know, associating with the elements or esoteric uh, rituals or alchemy or if these were things that interested you, we shouldn't look at those things and go, oh, oh, there's a pentagram. You know, it's like, well, we should find out what that means and understand what context in which it's used. Yeah. It doesn't have to be something nefarious. I, I think you know we're intelligent enough at this point, hopefully, to understand that. 
but there's still a very big area of the population that doesn't grasp that. Yeah, but you, have, they to, you have to at least testify to the fact that uh, we have been getting better as a group, becoming more aware. At the beginning, there yes. were certain people oh, yeah. who thought they were aware and they were they were loud mouths, and then now they've learned that uh, it's it's best just to be uh, humil have a little bit of humility in it because everyone's becoming a lot more aware. Oh yeah, it's really uh, a change. It really is. And the best thing to say is, I don't know. This is the, the only thing that frustrates me. I don't, I'll listen to anyone's crazy theory or not crazy theory. Yeah. But the only thing that really upsets me is someone says, I know. You know. Let me tell you how it is. And particularly when there's the, uh, I don't know what you guys have in Canada. Here in America, we have these um, quote unquote patriot movement types that say, get up your guns and rise up against this. And it's like, it's just fermenting violence and yeah. reactionary things to basically prejudices or uneducated stances. That's not to say there aren't manipulative forces. I, I want to make that very clear. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not trying to, um, you know, as I said to you before, it's not all pup and rainbows. There are some dark things that happen and we should be aware of those there's as well. There's an array of reactions that you could have yeah. to this and they're yeah. trying to get you on the base one. And you can go yeah. higher than that. Get the other tones. Get the nicer ones and you'll actually come out unscathed Unbruised. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, when you, when we talk about even, let's uh, sit, sit with art for a moment. The guy who made that poster for Muppets in mm -hmm. Space or whatever it is, did, did this person realize that they were encoding a mushroom? Was this an, an intentional thing? Very possibly. Very, very possibly. We can look through Jim Henson's uh, history. He is fully aware of esoteric signs and symbols. Um, He's definitely played with psychedelic aspects. Uh, he was a very um, intelligent and informed person and incorporated this stuff into all his artwork. Is it possible that someone did that intentionally? Yes, very, very possible. Mm -hmm. But what synchronicity reminds us over and over and over again, and I can speak for myself as someone who has written for many years um, fictional stories and even uh, doing artistic works, where I can go back and look at something a year later, two years later, five years later, and go, "Oh yeah. wow! How did I? Did I how did I? Fucking yeah, how know did that? I know that? Yeah. How did I know that?" That's always the same reaction for me is when I look back, and it could be not even a month, but when you go back to the past, how the fuck did I know that? Yeah, and it's almost like so, you left messages for yourself in the past <laughs> that hey, I was I was actually doing all right. Yeah, <laughs> this is why. So so this is why I don't think we can always just say it's it's intentional. Oh, it's intentional. That that the guy who made the Smurfs, he knew he was playing with alchemy. Maybe ninety percent sure, but I give you ten percent variance that maybe not. Because why do all um, alchemists take the same archetypes? It may be that in the process of alchemy, you meet the same archetypes no matter what. And if you haven't reached the next step, you're at least hinting at it in your work because you're gonna look back later on and go, "Fucking Christ, man, that bastard knew it all along." I, thank you. So this is a good point. Is it that the alchemist has? devised uh, a process for us, like in the sense that someone goes, oh look, that person is copying an alchemical narrative. Or is it that the alchemist or the Kabbalist mm -hmm. or whomever, you know, the, the uh, crafters of the I Ching. The Sufi, or, the artisan, right. go on and on. They're tapping into something and saying, hey, this is how it seems to work, that these are, these are the archetypes that can emerge and sometimes they like to emerge in this order. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's some mixing there. But for the most part, this is how it seems to work. Now, if you find that in everything, every piece of artwork, and again, your trip to the supermarket tomorrow and all this stuff, is that because some alchemist planned that for you? Or, because <laughs> or are you the fucking onto, alchemist? Right. Are, are, is, was he onto something and you're tapping into that same thing? Mm -hmm. This is a, you know we need to answer that question. We need to at least struggle with that question because I think too often people are saying, ah, this is an esoteric narrative that's being spoon-fed to us, which, you know, in some cases could be true. But more often than not, I feel like the evidence is there that if I can find this same alchemical sequence, this same Kabbalistic narrative in my supermarket, in my refrigerator, in a conversation on the telephone with... Know, my grandmother who's never heard these things and she says oh by the way I heard yeah. I was like you know <laughs> this is over and over and over again where we don't realize what we actually know so the art artistic example is a very good one because if we're accidentally or unknowingly tapping into this 
this realm where you said, yeah, I like to use the expression like messages to yourself in the future. Maybe because this realm seems to have this uh, temporal, fun it's a temporal phenomenon. You know, it's like mm -hmm. where it's it's not a linear, it's not linear time. It's just some sort of like moment of now where everything's here and you can kind of tap into this ether. So if you're doing that, maybe you are not only sending a message to yourself in the future, but maybe it's yourself in the future. That knowledge that you're going to have 20 years from now after you've studied the damn thing, maybe you're tapping into that already. I don't and, know how it works. And when you're, doing, <laughs> when you're doing art, you're actually tuning out just enough for let the subconscious come through within the ritual. So you actually are sending a message to every other link in time that's going to go back and look at this piece of paper. And I 100% believe that the subconscious knows the links and is communicating yep. to that person. And they liken it to if you they liken it to a river. If you go and you place yourself in the middle of the river, which is the flow of life, it will carry you places. And there's always the same bends and curves in this river. Now, if you want to fight the current and, and swim towards the shore, it's totally totally fine with us. But you're not going to catch the curves and bends because you got the hell out of the river. So, right. what we're basically talking about is jumping into the alch alchemical story, the journey of the hero. And all the great shamanic quests uh, in time, and uh, and what it could bring a person to understand. So, what have you understood? Where are you right now? Is there profound insight happening on a daily level? Oh, I, I, so. I think I think so. But uh, I would like to remind that there's also a challenge that comes with. It. I mean, uh, insights aren't always um, aren't always pleasant. Oh, okay, okay. Go, go your route. Yeah. Oh, well, I guess to say insights aren't always pleasant. You know, sometimes when you're doing something wrong, um, life has a way of, of showing you that too. Um, or, again, if, you're, if your external world is a reflection of the inner world, and vice versa, of course, um, sometimes, you know, it's this, these little reminders, uh, physician, heal thyself. So it's always easy to point fingers at something that's going on, like, uh, I'm just going to give you a, a kind of weird example here. This was a few years ago, but this is a it's a good one for current world events. There was a um, uh, in this apartment where I was where I'm living still. I was here a few years ago, and we had lived here for about two years and never had any kind of like infestation problem. And then there started to get like some roaches in the apartment. It's like that's really weird. Where are these things coming from? And at first, I was in this really zen state of like. You know, I can coexist with the roaches. No big deal. They're living beings. I'm living beings. We could totally coexist. I could share my food with them. Not a problem. <laughs> right? They have their place. And I was in this very, like, zen state of, like, no, I'm going to learn to coexist with these roaches. So <laughs> the problem gets worse, right? So um, now I have a cat. And what started to happen is my cat started to get sick all the time. And I realized that it's probably something with the roaches being gotten its food or I don't know, something. So I was like, all right, something's got to be done about this. I made my peace with it. I said I'm sorry to the, to the world and you know, made my peace with it. And I went to the store and I bought these uh, chemical traps. So you put the little traps around the apartment. And oh, the, I'm glad you said like, sorry first. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I put these you know, traps around and... It, so it ends up working. The roaches are gone. But I put those traps out. That same night, um, I'm on the internet and I'm just like looking at all the different news and stuff. And then but suddenly, boom, it was uh, the Israelis started spraying all this white phosphorus on the Palestinians, basically chemically wiping out their pests. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was like, oh, man, it would be so easy for me on a normal day to look at that news event and say, that is so horrible. And yeah. of course, we still do. But then to realize... That and you I, had I, played the archetype of the Isra Israelites. And how did that make you feel? How do you feel about the Israelites? I don't know you on that level. Well, well I'm not, I'm not anti-Israeli people. I'm not... You, you know, I, think I just meant the with, policy of what they do to Gaza and yeah, the Palestine area. Yeah, exactly. No, no, yeah. So uh, let's be very clear here. You know... Um, I have no issue with Jewish people, uh, is Israelis, or the people of Israel, but uh, at the same time, the policies of their government are atrocious. Oh, the so, powers that be are absolutely crazy. Yeah, it's yeah, a exactly. little ironic that they, they get Israel because of the, the Holocaust and the atrocities that followed that, and then they go and make the Gaza Strip. And no one calls them out on it. Like, uh, isn't that, uh, you know, all they're oh, missing is a railway line. Oh, that's all you're missing. 
It's total hypocrisy. I mean, and you build all these walled-in little cities. You're building ghettos. It's the yeah. same thing that happened to the Jews in Europe. And every so yes. often you go in and blow up their infrastructure. Hey, there were bombs in that school and those churches and, uh, well, sorry, mosque and that hospital. So, so everyone's what's, with you on that. Let's, let's look at this. So when we say that, uh, say, we realize that I was playing out that same archetype, mm -hmm. we realize that the Israeli government or powers that be are essentially doing the same thing. This is um, the same sort of natural life cycle that we see over and over again. Uh, something that I'm actually writing a book about right now is this idea of, you know, any attempt to overthrow the king, you end up becoming that which you fight. Yeah, exactly. So... We see this, the Israelis are a really good example of exactly this. So here we have people who were persecuted, killed in mass numbers, put into ghettos, all these horrible things were done to them, and now they're given a space and they're doing the same thing to other people. Now we can look at it and be judgmental and say it's total hypocrisy, which of course on one level it is. And on the other hand, you realize it, they're just playing it out. It's, it's the a same beautiful thing lesson to teach if you really pay attention. Right. I mean, you know, how many, you know, hippies from the 60s are now, you know, corporate CEOs who are like, oh, well, uh, you know, to fight the system, you got to work with the system. You know, yeah. yeah, you're becoming the thing that you hate. Now, on an, uh, to get real for a minute, and though, maybe say, you became the thing you hate because you understand it the most. Ah, mm -hmm. yeah. So this, let's get real for a minute. Like, as young guys who we're trying to figure out, there's a lot of things I see in this world that I don't like. And I don't want to just get desensitized to them. I don't want to just accept them and go, oh, you know, that's okay that people are being, you at know, murdered. Right. You know, but yeah, to at least like process it, to understand your place in it, uh, this is a really challenging thing. And this is why I said the synchronicities aren't always showing us this beautiful, oh, we're all just all connected. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of that, for real. You know, trust me, on a day-to-day -day basis, well, I get karma that. Karma like, is definitely involved in yeah. the synchronicity. That whole term from the Vedas, it comes from their study of synchronicity, is that there's good karma and there's bad karma, too. Yeah. So uh, sometimes it shows you things that you'd rather not be shown, that, oh, guess what? You know, what I do, every action of mine has uh, repercussions in this world, and I there are sometimes there are things that you can't escape. You know, there's the expression, um, an, an archetype that's not made conscious will reveal itself as fate. So this the idea that you, if you try and suppress or ignore an, an archetype or an aspect of yourself as being dark or something we'd rather not deal with, mm -hmm. you try and suppress it, it's going to come out anyway. And then you so call it coincidences which are actually synchronicities that you don't understand. Yeah. So it's better to be aware of them. Sometimes you can't, like you said, you can't always fight them. If you're in that stream, you can't always just swim upstream. Sometimes it's worth trying. I do think, you know, we don't want to... It's interesting, we, we say sync, right? S-Y-N-C. Mm -hmm. And there's this idea of like sync, as in like sinking. I think there are times where it's worth uh, resisting certain things and then there's the there's a group of synchromystics who take it from the perspective of they say sink don't swim it's the idea of like uh, relax float downstream you know it's like mm -hmm. just go with it just go with it trying to I'm do a little okay. word magic eh? yeah okay, cool, cool. so so I I however like to put a little little twist on that is to say Sure, we should go with the flow. If you're standing in the river of time and, and fate and like on that really grand scale, totally submit to that, no understand your place in it and do your best but to be in that. But know when to push and pull. Yes, yes. Sometimes the your place in that flow is to is to push or pull. Sometimes your place is to act. Sometimes Sometimes we can mistake things for being the flow of the universe that are actually manipulation. Like, you know, that, that's the thing. Like, I don't, I really don't come at this from a conspiratorial angle, but I think, um, I, I talked to this guy who has no idea the kind of things that I study. Just some guy in my neighborhood who um, I got a little friendly with. And he said to me one day, he said, oh, I was watching TV last night. I was watching wrestling. Okay, he's watching wrestling. I was okay. <laughs> Um, he says, he says, I was watching wrestling and, uh, he says, this commercial came on, uh, for a, to take out a loan for some, some like, you know, like probably super high interest rate, like I need money right away loan. The guy's always complaining about his finances. He says, and the commercial ended 
And the same commercial came on a second time. <laughs> he goes, and I took it as a sign from God that I was supposed to take out this loan. Now, for a guy who's not very bright, who's always com having financial troubles, this super high interest loan probably might not be the best thing for him. Yeah. Maybe in the grand scheme of things it is. Maybe I'm, I'm putting a judgment on it that shouldn't be there. But it seems to me we still need to have some common sense to say that, you know, just because some, you saw the same commercial twice doesn't mean you should do something. Be aware um, that people can play with this manipulation mm. and come with you. And they could just do it through words, through facial expressions, and through body positions and body postures. And they can play with you like nobody's business. And that's what, uh, I guess, the movement of uh, you go to a ceremony. Uh, sorry, uh, like you go with a whole bunch of people and get talked to on stage. That guy is up being the shit out of you making you stand up and spin and making you agree to what he's saying. And uh, you might think it's, oh, it's synchronicity. He feels the exact same way I do. And it's like, nah, man. He baited you and then he brought you to his, to his market, to his store. Yeah. You know, and, and that's why I said this is the challenge that we have is that how do we do this? Like, so you've started up uh, this new website. You're trying to get a pro projects going. I'm yeah. doing the same thing. Again, this is why I say... Uh, what I'm constantly confronted with is more challenges for all the wonderful insights I've had, and I'm not trying to downplay them at all. Um, and no, I know they're profound just, for, for you, and for, only for you. Yeah. yeah. So we, we have our like profound moments. You have the moments where you realize everything's going just as it should be. There are no accidents. Everything's going swimmingly perfectly. And then there are, are things that will continue to challenge you, and this is, I think, where we're at. You know, if this is uh, the beginner stage is everything's against me. Oh, my God, there's this terrible conspiracy connecting everything. Mm -hmm. The next stage is, no, everything's connected, everything's beautiful. And then I think the more advanced stage is, wait a second, everything's connected, and there's things, there are dangers in these woods that I should be aware of, these psychedelic head spaces. There are dangers that can confront me. There are dangers in the world. And how do I make sure that I don't become the very thing I don't want to become? How do I recognize these archetypes, recognize when I should push, when I should pull? And dis it's discernment. Discernment is this next stage. So uh, I think I'm at a point where I see a lot of challenges. So we talk about, I don't want to be the guy that come does these podcasts just to sell you a book. I really don't want that. And at the same time, I'd like to eat. How do I, <laughs> you know, how do I be the guy that can actually survive off of what I'm doing because right now you know this is a financial struggle we're trying to get something started here hey I'd like to have a business that at least provides so I can eat something and have my rent paid that's all I really ask for how do I do that without becoming the schmuck who's selling you you know phony knowledge or so how do you stay true to yourself and still sell a product is that possible I don't know we're trying to figure that out oh you're trying to figure it out <laughs> have you been to our yeah. website yeah, I've been to your website. Okay, because basically we're building an earthship that's going to house a good 50 people. And right. uh, rent? What rent? What rent? We've got <laughs> 60 acres. So as long as the 60 acres produces food, there is no rent. And there's a food issue right there. And we're looking for people who are actually doing stuff and actually uh, taking charge of those omens. So if you want to check it out, if you want to come down, if you want to live here, man, just, just hit us up. We'll, you'll have a Skype interview with the other guys. I don't know if they'll record it. Maybe Jordan might record it for high existence. And, uh, dude, I'm sure they'd, they'd fucking love you, and hey, it's, it's a hell of a time up here, man. Uh, a whole bunch of people striving to be uh, what they term superheroes, what I term, I don't know, I don't know what I term it, man. I, I was introduced to a god a long time ago, and uh, he's you, he's me, he's everyone, and he's willing to be you as long as you accept it and uh, self-inflict it. I guess it wouldn't be inflict, but self is still it on yourself. <laughs> yeah. So it's that, what we were saying earlier, I don't know if that was part of the recorded part or not, but the idea of being, you know, realizing you're um, part of this all-connected nature, some people feel infinitesimally small, you know, and some people feel, I'm the king of the world, I'm God, I, this, is, I, this is all me. You can go on a power trip or you can get really tiny and get depressed. Uh, it, the important thing is to balance those two things out. It's to remain humble in your godliness. It's to understand that you have this power, that you are a very influential spirit on this earth that can do a lot to change things. And also to remain humble in that and recognize there's also 7 billion other people out there who are also incredibly important, have their place, and you should be respectful of what they do. It's that 
it's that true meaning of namaste. You know, it's like it gets thrown around as a sort of like new age catchphrase. But what that truly means is like, I recognize there's a God within you. So it's to say that like, I'm not going to mess with you. I want to respect you. And also, I shouldn't let anyone step on me either because I also have a spark of divinity within me. So these are important things to realize. It's, it's really hard to find that sweet spot, but we try and find that balance, I think. And who knows, man? Even someone who watches wrestling could teach you something. <laughs> I wasn't trying to, you know. Uh, <laughs> that's no, but it could, come from, it could come from anything, man. There's sometimes <laughs> exactly. it's just the way that the wind is carrying that leaf that is telling you things. And it's just a matter of taking all your senses, focus them in, and then throw your emotion behind it, and your heart will send you back the information. It all comes from there, and then it's just processed by that brain. Yeah, very, very well said. Very well said. So uh, my computer actually died as I'm running on reserve battery. So we're going to cut it here, man. Uh, there's definitely going to be another show because this is too good. This is too good of a, of a conversation. And this is the way I would like to go along the lines of uh, you're not small. There's three levels. There's three octaves to this. At first, you're small and you want to hang on to your mom. And the next one is you're big and you want to take on the world. And after that, you realize you're everything and you can calm down and just help co-create. Yeah, that's the way to do it. That's I think that's the sweet spot. So uh, visit yeah. uh, allthehappycreatures.com. That's a, that's a fictional book that you're writing? Oh, that's done. That's that's was out a few years ago. Yes, yeah, so that's the name of my blog and uh, a book that I wrote, a fictional novel that I wrote. Um, and then we have uh, The Sync Book, Volume 2, just came out this week. Um, you can find that at thesyncbook.com, T-H-E-S-Y-N-C. Just uh, A lot of people are writing sync with an H, but just sync book, S-Y-N-C, thesyncbook.com. And uh, we got a bunch of books there that we've done, more to come, and just check it out. What I, uh, if, I, if we're still recording, what I'd yeah, like sure. to really throw out, what I uh, really like to plug is if you go to thesyncbook.com, please click on the authors button. There are now two volumes of books, each with 26 authors in it. So that's 52 authors. There are links to their websites, their blogs, and you can, most of this stuff is free. You know, you can go through their archives and stuff like that. And I just really encourage everyone to please sink into those, those links. Uh, it really means a lot to me if you check out those artists. And uh, make sure to check out uh, VahalMovement.com. We're actually making self-sustainable homes. We're going to catch our own rainwater. We're going to grow our own food. And we're going to do it all off the grid, uh, next to the grid. And then basically Joe and the people.